Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? I recently picked up this old ThinkPad. Let's see what it takes to get it up and running again. This is an IBM ThinkPad 390E from 1999. And it was a pretty mainstream kind of laptop during its day. There were a few different configurations you could get on this particular model. This is a low end one. It comes with a 12 inch LCD, but it could also be had in a 13 and 14 inch version, which also got you a little bit better resolution. This one has a 300 megahertz Celeron CPU, but the higher end models came with up to a 333 megahertz mobile Pentium 2. Base RAM on these was 32 megabytes. Um, some of the higher end ones came with 64. And you could get these with up to a 6.4 gig hard drive. Obviously, this is an older type of machine before IBM started doing the touch pads in the palm rest so all you got was the little track point nubbin thing here in the keyboard but what's particularly interesting about this machine is its bay configuration obviously this particular computer has been used for quite a while i actually picked it up off of the e-waste pile so I, I saved it from getting recycled it's overall in really good condition surprisingly enough it had the power supply with it, which doesn't always happen when you're grabbing stuff off of recycle piles. But it's just got a few, you know, kind of basic scratches and some label residue and stuff like that from use, but it's it's overall in really good shape. On the bottom is kind of typical IBM construction. So there's these connectors here for plugging it into a docking station. Here's the cover for, I believe, the RAM. The battery comes out just by pushing this tab and sliding it forward. And surprisingly enough, this battery still works. I'm, I'm quite surprised by that. I left the machine plugged in for a while and it actually powered on um, with the battery in there and the AC adapter unplugged. But this flex bay is really kind of curious. So it's the same type of latching design. And then this entire bay that has the floppy drive and CD-ROM can come out. Um, this is a 24 speed CD-ROM, but you could get different modules that would go into this bay on the side. And you can see, if I flip this thing up, there's this flappy door. So you can stick a wide variety of things, not just different kinds of like floppy or CD drives, but this thing was compatible with another battery. Um, I've read that they also made additional hard drive carriers that you could stick in here. And then things like zip drives and LS120, you know, the, the supposed successor to the floppy that never really took off. Also one curious little note from back in uh, the day when laptops were being made, like, you know, these bigger style, this has got feet, <laughs> fold out little, little plastic feet. Been a long time since I've seen laptops with feet on them. On this side, pretty typical layout. There's a built-in 56K modem, sound in and out with an actual like analog volume dial. It's been a long time since we've seen that too. Couple of PCMCIA card slots. This one came with, I believe this was an ethernet. Yeah, a 10100 ethernet card. I do have the dongle for that, I think somewhere i'll have to look for it around back pretty straightforward complement of ports uh, this is i believe ps2 serial vga your standard parallel port ac adapter in and then on this side usb the door is missing so i'm not sure if this is s video or ps2 actually that i believe is s video out for hooking up to like an old tv to present or whatever infrared for syncing with things like palm pilots and then your power switch nothing around front except for a couple of latches it's also been a long time since we've had laptops with latches to hold the screen closed when i first got this machine and powered it on i figured the hard drive 
was just blank, which is a good thing, right? If you're gonna send a machine out to get recycled, you wanna wipe the hard drive on it. But, you know, I'd go into the, into the BIOS on here and I'd wanna look at the system specs. And like I said, you know, I know that this thing has the 300 megahertz Celeron because it's got the sticker on the corner here and it actually says so, I believe, during, during boot. And obviously it's got the 12 inch display and here's, you know, the CPU and the speed. One thing that's really kind of frustrating about this machine is it doesn't list anything about its internal hard drive capabilities. Um, it'll tell you how much memory is in here, and this one has actually received a memory upgrade. It's got 160 meg in it, which is totally awesome. But nowhere in here do they talk about, like, anything to do with the hard drive. So, okay, fine. I guess IBM figured, you know, there's only one hard drive bay. So what would there be for you to configure regarding the hard drive in this thing? Something curious also is this is from the day before operating systems had, you know, really decent support for laptops. I believe this machine typically shipped with Windows 98. So all of your power saving features are actually in the BIOS here. Um, settings for, you know, how long the machine goes before it turns off the screen or spins down the hard drive or, you know, goes into to sleep mode or whatever. Um, you actually set all those things in the BIOS instead of in the OS, which is very interesting. So when I first powered this machine on, after going through the BIOS and not seeing any settings about the hard drive in there, any ideas to what its capacity was, I figure, okay, I'm just going to let the machine finish booting. You know, maybe, maybe it'll tell me somewhere in there, maybe there will actually be an OS on this hard drive, who knows? So I let the machine sit and basically it never boots. Uh, it just sits here at this blinking screen and then goes to operating system not found. So I figure, oh, okay, they wipe the hard drive. If I want to figure out what its specs are, its capacity, all that, I need to pull it out. Now, the hard drive bay on this machine is actually quite serviceable, which is rather surprising. It's this little door here in the back. And of course, I've got it loosened to make life a little bit easier for us here. And then this door comes off and then your hard drive goes in there. But when I took the door off, I saw that, which is a whole lot of nothing. So unfortunately, they had taken the hard drive out before putting the machine on the recycle pile. The bummer, though, is you can't just stick any normal IDE laptop hard drive in here as is. This is a very specific size bay. There's no way to screw the drive in. There's no like holes in the bottom to screw the drive in or anything. And it's tough to see in there, but it's also not a standard connector on the inside. So in order to get a hard drive working in that bay, first thing I needed to buy was this little adapter. And it basically takes you from the standard IDE pin arrangement to this kind of edge connector proprietary thing that IBM was doing. And this was easy enough to find. It was all of about, I think four bucks shipped off of eBay uh, from somewhere here in the US. But then I got to thinking, you know, what kind of hard drive do I even want to put in this thing? It doesn't have anything in it now, so I can kind of blank slate this a little bit. Do I want to put like a really big hard drive in there? Maybe I can stick a whole bunch of games or multi-boot different OS's or something like that. But then I got to thinking, you know, do I really want to stick a mechanical hard drive in this thing? So that, you know, the lack of having a spare part and my general reluctance to want to put another mechanical drive in this thing that ultimately is going to fail. And I should note that I'm not necessarily like a purist when it comes to getting this machine back to it's like original specifications. I'm not trying to restore this thing back to factory condition or anything. I just want to get it up and running again. So that all kind of combined to lead me to go pick up one of these. And this is a compact flash card. What's interesting about compact flash is that it's actually based on the same kind of set of protocols as IDE hard drives. There are a few differences here and there and, you know, it, it obviously there's major 
differences in capacities, like this is an eight gig card and it's only like this big. But in general, these are compatible with computers that are just looking for a regular IDE hard drive. And apparently a lot of people will do this kind of conversion where they'll get rid of a mechanical drive and swap it out for a compact flash card because obviously this is solid state. It's going to be way more reliable in the long term. And if you can read the label on this card, it says Mettler Toledo on there. And I, I don't know what specific product this card came out of, but I know that company makes things like industrial and commercial scales. Um, basically embedded kind of computing devices. So if they went and put a compact flash card in an embedded computing device, obviously I'm on the right track because they know that doing this works. So I picked up a lot of these cards. I think I got three or four of them. Um, these were not brand new, but I think I paid maybe 25, 30 bucks shipped for that entire lot of cards. Um, which I think is a decent deal and 8 gig of space is still going to be plenty for a machine like this. Now in order to get that card to work in this computer, I need one more piece and that is this. This is a compact flash to IDE adapter. And these are surprisingly inexpensive, mostly because they appear to be really simple. Uh, this one cost me I think 3 bucks shipped from China. Obviously, it took forever to get here, um, but you know, it, it looks like a really simple device. I'm not seeing any sort of like active electronics on it or anything. Um, it just, you know, you stick the card in here and then you plug the other end into, you know, your IDE cable or directly into your laptop or into an adapter deal like this, and then it should just work. Um, there are some jumper settings here that you can use and just looking at it they're saying jumper one two is master slash slave and then jumper two three is slave slash master why are they having the second word on there slave and master i would think that it would just be like jumper one two is set this as master jumper two three is set this as slave Solder pads, this, and those are the same. Oh, oh, interesting. So this company, this is very crafty. Okay, so here's what's going on. This board, this PCB can actually get used for multiple products. So this is obviously a single card board, right? You just stick, you can only stick one compact flash in here and it'll just present as one drive to your computer. But if you look at the back, they've got the same solder pads here and these four corners as for this connector. I suspect they sell another version of this adapter with a second compact flash card reader on the back. So you could have two drives. So you could have like, you know, effectively a C drive on one card and a D drive on the other as separate hard drives. And then this jumper basically flips as to which card is identified as master and which one's identified as slave. That's really crafty, okay. So anyway, the idea is you, uh, you know, I'm gonna drop the card into the adapter here and then I stick this guy on the end and then that's it. Looking at that bay in the back of the computer, I can't necessarily just throw this in as is because that's a pretty big hard drive bay. Obviously, it's designed for a full two and a half inch drive, and this is a lot smaller. I'm afraid this thing's going to be kind of flapping around back there, and it may fall out. I don't suspect this edge connector holds on very tightly. So I picked up one more thing, and this was actually quite a bit harder to find. This is the metal cage that the original hard drive would go into. This particular model of laptop seems really kind of standard. You know, it seems like a really typical kind of mainstream model, but it's really hard to find parts for this online. It took me a while. I finally found a seller that had this cage on it, uh, you know, in stock and available. 
and it was from a seller in Germany. So I guess hello to all of my German viewers. Um, some e-recycling, you know, e-waste kind of shop. It cost me 20 bucks shipped from there, so not terribly expensive. But it was the only one that I could find. I couldn't find anybody in the US selling this drive cage. And maybe this cage is swappable between multiple ThinkPad models. I don't know, I couldn't find any information about it. But anyway, this is the last thing that I think I'll need in order to get this all working. Now, something we'll have to figure out is how do I get that to stay in there? You know, like, because otherwise it's just gonna rattle around and stuff. Uh, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. First things first, I wanna make sure that this works in the laptop before I commit to figuring out how to adhere all of this down because who knows maybe they're doing something weird and this whole setup won't work and I'll have to you know switch back to using a regular mechanical drive. I took a piece of capped on tape stuck it to the back and then made like a little pull tab out of it right so this is all taped together it won't fall apart on me but now I can pull it out of the back of the computer you know, without needing to stick it in that cage. I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to see this and we'll see how well I can do this. Yeah, see it may be, okay, so I can feel it. It's in the edge connector, but it's in there really loose. And I'm not sure if you can tell, it's really dark, but it's kind of, it's really loose in there. It doesn't wanna stay put. So I definitely need to figure out a better permanent solution, but for testing and just getting this thing up and running, this should work just fine. All right, so let's plug in power here. And just for grins, let's start turning it on. Okay, yeah, uh, it's kind of what I was expecting. So operating system not found. Let's try getting a boot CD in here and see if we can maybe get a copy of Windows installed or something. Okay, attempt number two, I've got a Windows install disk in there. Let's see. Yeah, I want to boot from CD-ROM. Uh, let's just start Windows Setup from CD-ROM, why not? Let's see if the thing's formatted and just maybe doesn't have an operating system on it. Cannot install. Does not have a hard disk. Your hard disk is not okay. So the hard drive is probably completely unformatted. So let's quit Setup. Uh, is F disk on here? No fixed disks present. Okay. I'm gonna have to do a little bit of research. Okay, so I did some digging. Here's what I was able to find out. Yes, compact flash cards work great as boot disks for laptops, you know, anything that needs IDE. Except, and now my memory is being jostled after seeing this message about no fixed disks present, the keyword fixed is what got me thinking. Compact flash cards can have two modes. They can have what they call removable mode and then fixed mode. It's largely just a function of the way the firmware on the card has been set up. Removable mode obviously is for if you want to use this in something like a digital camera or you know whatever where you're going to be frequently plugging in the card and removing it. And especially if you want to be able to hot plug the card into something like a card reader on a PC so that you can, you know, maybe pick the pictures up off of it, whatever. And I remember doing that a lot when I would have digital cameras that would use this format. Apparently most compact flash cards ship in removable mode, but Windows in particular and some other operating systems actually need any drive that they get installed to to identify as a fixed disk, which has a slightly different set of commands or something like that, I guess. It basically makes it behave more like a traditional hard drive instead of, you know, removable media. Now, in doing a little bit of digging, I'm lucky in that I bought a SanDisk card because at one point SanDisk offered a utility that you could you know, boot off of and run to convert between the two modes. Now, if you go to SanDisk's website today, they've got a knowledge base article that talks about this, but they then go on to say that they no longer sell 
compact flash cards that are set as fixed from the factory. And they also no longer offer a utility that lets you flip back and forth between the two modes on the cards. And one other little note is I read some reports from people who have gone down this rabbit hole and found that not all of the SanDisk cards are compatible with the utility. So SanDisk doesn't have that utility available anymore, uh, but I was able to <clears throat> find it on the internet. So let me get a boot disk going and we'll stick the card in there and see what we can do to get it converted. Well, I gotta say, when this thing's first booting up, like with the fan going on the side and the CD-ROM drive spinning up, this computer is like really, really noisy. Okay, um, well, yeah, I, I want to boot to DOS, so I guess I choose DOS. All right, so let's, um... Okay, so this first utility is the one that I'm looking for. It, it got shortened because it's the characters are too long, but it's... ATCFWCHG is the name of the program. And if you pass some parameters after it, then it will supposedly switch the mode on the compact flashcard, assuming it can see it. So let's see. Uh, tilde one. And then it's slash P for primary, as in like the primary IDE and then slash F as in fixed. Let's see what that comes back with. The CD-ROM drive in this thing's being weird. I don't know what's up with that. It's like spinning up and down over and over, and now it seems to be having trouble reading. Is the disk dirty? I just burned it. I don't know. Let me, um, let me turn this thing off and back on again. The joys of working on old computers. Okay, take two. I blew the dust off the disc and off the laser lens, and, and hopefully that uh, that does it here. C, F, W, C, tilde, one, slash, P for primary, slash, F for fixed. All right, it ran. Uh, oh, fail error number seven. But I, it sees the card. 08G, 8 gigabyte. Okay, so this utility can see the card, but it didn't want to do it. That sucks. <laughs> All right, so I went digging around in the closet and I actually found in one of my old camera bags another compact flash card. Um, I didn't realize that I had this in there, otherwise, I, you know, wouldn't have bought. The ones off of eBay, but this is a two gig card. I'm hoping that's plenty. It probably will be, right? Um, it's a bit slower. This one says it's 15 megabytes per second. The other one I think said 50, but at this point, I think pretty much anything's gonna be faster than an original IDE drive. Um, I remember using cards like this with one of my old digital cameras. So hopefully this one will work with this utility. It'll fit, you know, kind of in that same time range as to when that utility was common. Uh, I don't know when that program was written and there's no published spec as to which cards that program is compatible with. So it's, I think, just going to be kind of a trial and error type of a deal. Um, I think this card is probably from sometime in the early 2000s would be my best guess, but let's get it swapped into that adapter and then run this utility again and see what we get. Okay, I got that card swapped into that adapter instead. Let's give this utility another shot. Cross fingers, we'll see what we get here. A, T, C, F, W, C, hold a one, slash P, slash F for fixed. Here we go. Oh, oh, I think we did it. That's a much better result than we got last time with that error message. So let's swap out the disks here. I'm just gonna do this right now. Let's swap out CDs. So that was my boot disk. Let's put the Windows disk back in there. Let her spin up for a second. Three finger salute, control, delete, here we go. 
All right, so I'm off of my Windows install disk. I just booted straight into DOS mode instead of Windows setup because I have a feeling I'm going to need to wipe this compact flash card. I'm quite sure I used it in a digital camera in the past, and that's probably not going to make Windows so happy. So let's fire up FDisk and, and format this thing. Uh, that's not good. Wait a minute, wait a minute, hang on, hang on. When that utility runs to change between fixed and removable mode, what I read is that it sets a bit in the firmware of the card, right? Because the firmware can be in both modes, you know, either or. And it's basically just telling the firmware of the card to switch between the two. I just did a soft reboot on this laptop. So, the computer never turned off and back on again. I wonder if you have to power cycle the card for that change to take effect. Hang on, I'm gonna just turn the computer off all the way. Okay, so I turned it off completely and back on again. Let's see what we get. Oh! <laughs> it's seeing it now. I wouldn't get here if it didn't see the drive. Your computer has a disk larger than 512 megabytes. Oh, go figure. Okay. So, you know, the the kind of joke with tech support about have you turned it off and back on again? Yeah, there's a reason why that's a good suggestion because that totally fixed this problem. I literally just turned it off and back on again. What do we have? It's seeing the whole thing. 2 gig, FAT16, wow. Oh yeah, this is from my old digital camera, Nikon D70S. That was my first DSLR that I owned. So this was an original card that I had from that. So I'm gonna need to wipe this disc. So let's go and delete the partition. Yes, I want to delete that one. Uh, volume label, oh, that's right. They make you type it in to like be really sure you wanna do it. Am I sure? I'm pretty sure I got all the pictures off of this card from... That's got to be over 10 years. That's probably... This card is probably 13, 14 years old. I, I imagine I got all the pictures off of it. So yeah, go ahead and wipe it. Let's create a new primary DOS partition. Well, we're verifying the integrity. That's pretty quick. See, and that's the nice thing, right? Is it's... it's a card like this is going to be faster than a mechanical drive for sure. Yeah, I want to use the maximum area. We have to verify it again. I don't know why. You must restart your system for changes to take effect. Okay. All right, I've rebooted the machine, but I'm back into just the DOS shell here because I think I need to set the partition is active. I don't think the Windows installer will do that for me. Oh, it already is. Okay, well, that was a waste of time. Okay, this time I am booting from the CD-ROM, but I'm gonna boot from the Windows, go straight into Windows setup, because my hard drive should be ready to go at this point. Let's, let's cross fingers this time. And what version of Windows am I installing, you wonder? Well, Windows me, of course. I mean, I've put up with enough crap on this computer so far, I've had to figure out why I didn't want to see the compact flash card and then dealing with the whole reboot and all that stuff why not continue to you know cause myself pain and suffering by installing windows me on this machine so yeah enter to continue uh format the drive yeah i probably should do that a routine check on my system okay if you say so Boy, talk about like making things hard on myself i forgot how long it takes to install these older versions of windows I thought it'd be like 20 minutes. Well, you know, it's over an hour later and it's finally done. It just sits there and wants to spend all its time detecting hardware and selling drivers. Okay, whatever. Windows is installed on this thing. I still have some more work to do with it, but whatever. I want to deal with that hard drive situation. So I'm going to go ahead and shut this thing down and then we can figure out the best way to deal with that drive. So you'll remember that I had set up this little pull tab. It's a little warm. Forgot that those are actually warm. Anyway, 
So let's come up with a more permanent solution for keeping this inside that hard drive bay. I don't want it to accidentally fall out or whatever while I'm moving the machine or something. So if you recall, I also bought this. And this is the cage that the original drive fits in. Here's the bottom part and there are like little tabs here that the mechanical hard drive would get held in by. It just kind of goes and locks into the holes on the side of the drive. This adapter setup doesn't have that. In fact, there's really no way to mount this to here with, you know, its own thing. I'm, I'm suspecting it needs to sit in there kind of like that. But what am I going to do to keep it in there? Well, this is my secret weapon for a lot of stuff, and this is called 3M VHB tape. That stands for very high bond. It's actually the same stuff that they use to hold like molding and trim and logos and stuff on cars on the outside. Um, it's like this foam double stick tape, but it's really strong and it comes off clean if you ever need to. It's not like that cheap foam tape. So I'm gonna use some of this to hold this guy in place. The question is, can I get this thing lined up properly? So let's take the old pull tab deal off the back here. And I'm not gonna bother taping the card into the adapter simply because that card seems to fit in there pretty, uh, pretty sturdy. Doesn't seem to wanna come out too easily. I don't think I'm going to need a whole lot of this tape. So let's go somewhere kind of like that. Before I commit, let's line this up. And I think... I think this adapter needs to be on the outside. So the idea is when this is all done and put together, it kind of sits something like that maybe? There we go. Okay, let's see what we can do here. Something like that, I feel. Okay, close it up. Okay, can we? There we go. All right, it's in. It's in. Thumbs up. Now we can get this cover back on. And I'll just use a spudger to screw it back in. And let's finish getting this thing set up. All right, we're all booted up. Um, I don't remember putting a password in when I set it up, so I'm assuming it's blank. What's really nice about this machine is when the fan isn't spinning and the CD-ROM drive isn't spinning, this thing is perfectly silent. Like there's n absolutely no noise coming out of this computer because of that compact flash drive, which is another super awesome thing for, you know, if you want to play old games or whatever, you won't have all this extraneous noise and stuff going on. Okay, finally to the desktop. Um, all right, let's... What is going on? Hang on a minute. Do you see this? What is that? It moving on its own? What? Now it stopped. The pointer was moving on its own. I wouldn't be touching anything and it would just be kind of creeping, but now it's done. Okay, anyway, so that kind of speaks to what I think I need to do next. Um, I burned a CD full of drivers. I got the drivers for this thing, and I and I got to give this community some credit for sure. Thinkpads.com, plural Thinkpad. Um, they've got like a ton of drivers for all these different models of Thinkpads on their site, including these really older models. It's not all just newer ones. Obviously, they talk about newer machines there too, but they've got just tons and tons of these older drivers so i was able to go through and find like all the drivers and bios updates and everything and they were just right there so i burned them all to a cd and yep good it sees it yep and there's all my files and everything 
but I'm not sure how many of these are actually necessary. So let's, oh, it's been a while since I've used one of these touch points, um, track point, whatever they call them. Let's get into device mangler here and see how much stuff I'm missing. I don't think I'm missing anything. Normally I'd be seeing exclamation points where stuff is missing with, you know, it's saying unknown device or whatever. Um, let's just make sure it's not using generic drivers. No, that's, that's right. Okay, I can install a monitor file. Uh, let's check networking. Wow, yeah, it sees my, uh, sees the card bus adapter, sees the infrared port. Uh, sound card? Yeah, sound card's there. There's some random utilities here too. Let's install the monitor file. I don't think that's actually necessary because this screen is showing the correct resolution. One of the things to remember with these old displays, these old laptops is they don't necessarily all do video scaling. So if I were to go into the display properties and change this from like 800 by 600 down to 640 by 480, it wouldn't stretch the image out to the full size of the screen. It would just show 640 by 480 kind of in a box in the middle of the display. Okay, so did it install that or did it just extract it somewhere? I wasn't paying attention because I was talking to you guys. So let's go back into here and see if that device changed. So yeah, let's try and give it a new monitor file here. I'm gonna have to specify that. No, it's not on there. It's gonna be. It's gonna be in C drive. No, there is no. Thank you. Uh, oh, drivers. Win. Monitor. Uh, win me. Oh, okay. Well, so there is no monitor file to worry about. So yeah, I'm done with drivers. Okay, that's cool. I, I don't have to worry about that after all. Um, I guess 98 needs drivers, but maybe Windows Me doesn't, even though they published Windows Me drivers. Not sure. The next step is we need to put some software on this guy before we call it done. And if you know me, which at this point, if you've been watching for a while, you probably do, you should know what software I'm gonna be installing next. Of course, it's going to be SimCity 2000, because why would it not be SimCity 2000? Oh, I, I can make sure that the sound works this way, too. All right. Uh, yeah, let's just put it all in there. Why not? Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. There we go. Ding, ding, ding. Cool. Kind of quiet, but... But we've got sound. So yeah, all the drivers are done. We've got good old SimCity 2000 on here. Let's go check how much hard drive space that took up. So remember, I put a 2 gig drive in there. 2 gig flash card. And oh yeah, this thing, Windows only took up 500 meg. That's like nothing. So I got plenty of room for more games or whatever I want to put on here. And that's about all there is to it with this one. The old ThinkPad 390E from 1999 is back in action, and it actually doesn't perform too badly. Obviously, the RAM upgrade that it came with was a big help, but that compact flash card is definitely going to lend some reliability for the long term. Those old mechanical drives are just going to keep dying as time goes on, and they're going to become harder and harder to find. Yeah, I spent a few bucks getting this thing up and running again. That adapter was three or four bucks to go from IDE to Compact Flash. The little edge connector was four bucks. That drive cage was about 20. I ended up not needing to buy the Compact Flash card after all because I just found one that I didn't realize I had. But even if you had to go buy one of those cards, it's a few bucks. This is generally a really inexpensive type of conversion and the benefits are great. The fan is turned off on this machine. I don't have a disc in the optical drive, so it's completely silent, and it's gonna be good to go for quite a few years going forward. 
So if you like this episode, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.